A very good afternoon and welcome back to this program of compendium of lectures on laparoscopic surgery. My dear students, I stand here, Dr. Mushtaq Chalku, Associate Professor, Gaman Medical College, Srinagar, Kashmir. I believe you have been watching me for quite a bit of time and we have been discussing the minimal access surgery. Today, what are we with? We are with a very exciting and scintillating topic that we surgeons encounter every day in and day out. Can you guess it? Yes, we are going to talk about the endoscopic anatomy of the inguinal hernia. Friends, hernia is a word that means an abnormal protrusion of part or whole of a viscous through an abnormal opening of its containing cavity. But before we talk about hernia, it is mandatory to understand and know the anatomy of the inguinal canal. When we talk about hernia, it invariably means we talk about the groin, the inguinal region. And in that region, we have inguinal canal. Now, I'm not here to tell you and talk about the open techniques, the historical background dates back to 1800th century, late, when open procedures for open techniques for hernia were rampant. Then in early 1900th century, Lichtenstein mesh hernioplasty by open technique became gold standard and continues to be that. But later in 19th century, we the surgeons being the innovators and with a constant research, we found that laparoscopy has advantages over the open repairs. And as of now, the current scenario for the management of these hernias is laparoscopic surgery. And that's what concerns me today for this talk. And when I talk about the endoscopic anatomy, I, you will agree with me that we have been tuned to, we have been taught the open anatomy. That is, we were approaching inguinal canal anteriorly. That is the open repairs. But laparoscopy, we are approaching this canal posteriorly. So that means it's a posterior repair where we put a mesh and we call it laparoscopic mesh hernioplasty. Before I venture further, I should tell you this time it reminds me of the Sir Astley Cooper somewhere in 1804 made a comment. He said that no disease of human body belonging to the province of surgeon requires in its treatment better combination of accurate anatomical skills in all its variants. That goes to say that we need to revise this endoscopic anatomy because in our medical days we have not been taught about the endoscopic anatomy that is the posterior anatomy of the inguinal region since we are, we are only taught the anterior anatomy that's why we are familiar with the anterior anatomy but when we go on to talk about the laparoscopic repairs, it becomes mandatory. So before we go into the repairs, the techniques, I believe it's a must to understand before uh, journeying into this uh, area, we must get familiarized with the anatomy, the know-how of this area, uh, that is the endoscopic anatomy. Now, why did we go for a laparoscopic approach? An open approach was rampant. Why did we go for a laparoscopic approach? Because a laparoscopic approach, we only went for things that laparoscopic approach is, you know, attacking this disease, this surgical ailment posteriorly from the point of origin. Please make it clear that we are attacking the disease from the point of origin. Now, where is the point of origin? It is from inside out. So, the problem arises from within the 
abdominal cavity then it presents out and projects in the groin or the inguinal region as the hernia. So it is attacking the point of origin. We are attacking it posteriorly within the abdominal cavity. While as in open hernias, we are attacking it at the point of presentation. That is, we are attacking it in the inguinal region by playing a mesh. We call it only repair. So when we are attacking it posteriorly, we are basically, you know, attacking the all areas of the deficiency, the all areas of weakness. And what is that? That is the myopectinal orifice of fruit chart. Now, what is this myopectinal orifice of Fruchard? The myopectinal orifice of Fruchard is, it dates back to 1956 when Henry Fruchard espoused a theory that there is a general a weakness in this area and this area is bounded medially by the lateral border of the rectus abdominis, inferiorly by the superior pubic ramus, laterally by the iliosos muscles and uh, inferiorly by the superior pubic ramus and superiorly by the conjoint tendon that is internal oblique and transversus abdominis. If you see this area, we call it myopectinal orifice of Fruchot and this weak area encompasses few openings. You call it the uh, deep inguinal ring, you call it femoral ring, you have other uh, supravasical uh, spaces. So this is all an area which is basically weak. And this weak area, you know, this becomes the potential place for development of a hernia. In open approach, I must say that we are familiar. We see the structures like ilioinguinal nerve, inguinal ligament, pubic tubercle and lacunar ligament. While as in laparoscopic repair, laparoscopic approach, we just see iliopubic tract and we see Cooper's ligament. So understand this is the difference because we are not tuned to looking and doing repairs, most of us, laparoscopically. We will not see those structures which we used to see in open surgery. So one has to get familiar with the anatomy and that's the crux of today's lecture. Now, there is one more interesting quote by the famous uh, surgeon, Sir Ogilvy, he says that I know more than 100 surgeons whom I would cheerfully give my gallbladder to get operated on, but only one whom I would give my inguinal canal to explore. That means that the anatomy, the accurate knowledge, the precision of the structures has to be understood before you venture, before you visit this area with your surgical armamentarium to correct hernia. This is the idea what Ogilvy said uh, long back. Now, as regards the pure anatomy, endoscopic anatomy of this area, I must say that it is a functional composite of the musculoskeletal, the visceral and the neurovascular structures that together form the integrity of this area and it is the disruption of this area, these structures, this area that makes a weak point for a potential organ of the abdomen or a viscera to protrude through this. And the important thing to understand is that the hernia is an outcome of a raised intra-abdominal pressure. Friends, it's very important to understand the etiology of a disease. If you understand the etiology of a disease, your scientific repair, your sci repair, your technique of your, your, your skill, your, or any technique will not be successful unless you understand the etiology. You have to attack the etiology. So the raised intra-abdominal pressure can be because of coughing, because of lifting heavy weights, because of constipation, laying, you know, force on forcing your stools out, pregnancy, excessive fat in the abdomen or any intra-abdominal tumor, they all increase the intra-abdominal pressure and that becomes the cause for hernia. Now one needs to understand that before we visit into this area, we have to understand this whole area that is the inguinal area posteriorly when, as we see it when we put an 
laparoscope or an endoscope. So friends, there are certain folds which I am going to talk about and the, in the images you will be watching them, you will be seeing each fold, how it is designed, how the creator, our God has designed these folds and I believe, I must say, they have been designed only for us as the surgeons to recognize the important landmarks. When you enter into the peritoneal cavity and you focus the endoscope to this inguinal area, this is first thing what you see are these folds which are called as the peritoneal landmarks. Now what are these folds? The first fold that you will see in the midline is called the median umbilical ligament. Now, what is median umbilical ligament? Median umbilical ligament is a fold of the peritoneum that is raised by a structure called as the allantois. Now this obliterated allantois or allantoic duct gets obliterated and it raises a fold called as the median umbilical fold. If you stay, go a little lateral around 5 centimeters from it, you find an another fold that, raise, that, that comes out, you know, it comes out and falls into the abdomen. This is the medial umbilical ligament. Now what is a medial umbilical ligament? Medial umbilical ligament is raised by obliterated umbilical artery which if you trace down comes from the internal iliac artery. This is an another fold. If you go lateral to that medial umbilical fold, you will find a very, uh, you know, not exactly well marked, not well marked, but a fold. You will find something getting raised from this peritoneal cavity, uh, by raising a fold there called as the lateral umbilical fold. Now, what is this lateral umbilical fold? This is a fold that is raised by inferior epigastric artery and this inferior epigastric artery is a branch of the external iliac artery and it raises a fold called as the lateral umbilical fold. So friends, once we talk about these folds, these are the landmarks that you will see at the first when you pass endoscope to this, this area. Now, why do we want to know these folds? Because you will recognize this area within these folds. And now, after you have recognized these folds, you have to understand that these folds, between them are crea created spaces, we call them foci. So, we have a, a median umbilical uh, fossa, we have a medial umbilical fossa, we have a lateral umbilical fossa. The medial umbilical fossa is the space that lies between from the umbilicus down between the median umbilical ligament and the medial umbilical ligament. Okay? So, this is the space where, uh, you know, some of the hernias of uh, supravasical hernias will come up because the bladder is in this area. So between the medial umbilical ligament and the lateral umbilical ligament will be the, you know, what we call as the uh, umbilical fossa, medial umbilical. So that was median umbilical fossa, we have medial umbilical fossa. Here we have uh, the things like uh, direct hernia will come here and femoral hernia will come here. And lateral to the lateral umbilical fold, we have indirect hernia because the inferior epigastric uh, artery will form the medial lip of the deep inguinal ring and you will find a hole over there and through this hole will pass the structures of the supermatic cord. Now supermatic cord you all understand it is made up of the supermatic vessels, it has got lymphatics, it has got loose areolar tissue, it has got the sac which lies anterolateral to the cord and this, these all structures pass through the deep ring pass through the inguinal canal and then enter into the scrotum through the superficial inguinal ring. This is what you will find it there. And a process as vaginalis that is not obliterated will form the future sac. And in that sac, you can invite, you know, the contents of the hernia. I'm not going to talk about the classification of hernia, the types of hernia. No, I'm here to just tell you more about the anatomical aspects of the hernia. Now that is the hernia which develops through this deep ring and travels through the uh, inguinal canal and goes into the scrotum. This is the indirect hernia. So that is the importance of knowing these foci what we are talking about. Now one important interesting uh, thing here is to note that you must have heard about the Hazelback strangle. 
Hazelback triangle is a triangular area which is bounded medially by the lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscle, laterally by the inferior epigastric artery and the floor is formed by the inguinal ligament. Here in laparoscopic uh, view, it will be iliopubic tract. Iliopubic tract, you can understand, it is the sister concern of the inguinal ligament. In open repairs, you see inguinal ligament. In laparoscopic repairs, you see the same thing and you shout out sometimes it's possible, I'm seeing lapros inguinal ligament. It is not inguinal ligament, it is iliopubic tract. So this is the triangle of Hazelback, also called inguinal triangle. This is a potential weak area where the direct hernia will always come up. I hope now I am clear to tell you about the anatomy, what is the area where the indirect hernia develops, what is the area where the, where the direct hernia develops and what is the area where the femoral hernia develops or the supravasical or unnamed hernias uh, develop. And this makes me to tell you that we have to understand the pre-properitoneal space. Now what is pre-properitoneal space? It is also called extraperitoneal space. It's also called as peritoneal space. And this pro-peritoneal space is the space that is uh, actually bounded by or you know designed all across because of the presence of fascia transversalis. We call it the ligament of Gallaudet. Yeah, that's an interesting name. You need to remember that. Ligament of Gallaudet is the person who described this fascia transfer cells and it reminds me here that thanks to laparoscopic surgery that the anatomy of this fascia transfer cells got revised. Before that we knew that this gives integrity to this area of inguinal area but now it we believe it does not. We believe this is a unilaminar structure. Now we believe it is a bilaminar structure salute to laparoscopy and endoscopy because of high definition cameras we could better study this this ligament or this fascia we call as the fascia of transversalis or transversalis fascia now what is this fascia transversalis you all understand the fascia transversalis below the umbilicus you know it it is a single structure but below the umbilicus, it splits into an anterior layer and a posterior layer. And these two layers blend at the Cooper's ligament. Now this fascia transversalis has got uh, boundaries, the anterior boundary. Anteriorly, it is bounded by the anterior layer of fascia transversalis, posteriorly by the posterior layer of fascia transversalis. Now the muscle, rectus abdominis, they come up from the pubic tubercle up. Now understand the anterior layer of the fascia transversalis will cover it and between the anterior layer of the fascia transversalis and the peritoneum you will have the posterior layer of the fascia transversalis. So the anterior space is called is not the true space where you should go that is my point to tell you. You know the anterior space is the vascular space and is not the true space where you should you know dissect when we are doing totally extra peritoneal repair. And we should go into the posterior space, that is the true space, which is called the space of Bogros. I hope I am clear, space of Bogros I am talking about. So this space of Bogros, where if we go into this space, your surgery will be pleasure. It will not be bloody. If you go into anterior space, you will have vascular uh, structures, you will have a lot of bleeding and the procedure will become messy. People will not enjoy it. So you need to go into the right space and that is why as of now, if you see the most of the surgeons who understand this point, they will not make the space with a balloon. They will make the space either with the finger or with you can say the telescope because they will make it under vision. They know the art of going into the right space. That's what I wanted to convey. And if you understand this art of getting into the space, right true space of Bogros, your surgery, I must say, you will enjoy it. You will enjoy this journey through this space and the procedure will be bloodless. That is very important to understand. Now, what are the other things that this transversalis fascia makes? It makes many structures like interfovular ligament, like iliopubic tract. This iliopubic tract is an extension from the Cooper's ligament and it traverses all along across towards the anterior superior iliac spine. 
and this will divide our this whole myobacterial orifice into two spaces the inguinal area that's above uh, and that is the inguinal uh, area what is the superior area where the ingu inguinal hernias will develop and the inferior area that is below the iliopubic tract where the uh, true femoral hernia will develop so that is very interesting and important uh, structure that is iliopubic tract and this iliopubic tract is nothing but it is an extension and blend of fascia transversalis so one one needs to know that this fascia transversalis is a very important you know structure to note that um, when you do a laparoscopic uh, repair now now to understand that what exactly are these spaces you will ha you must have heard by now that there is something called the triangle of doom you must have heard about the triangle of doom then you must have heard about the quadrangle of pain or the triangle of pain or you must have heard the the the, the space trapezoid space of trapezoid the disaster space you must have heard a word like corona mortis you know all this space i am going to talk one by one so friends just stay here now first of all what is triangle of doom of course it is a doom because it contains very important structures this triangle is bounded medially by a structure called vas deferens vas deferens will you know arise from the deep inguinal ring i will emit from that and will travel all and will cross the iliac vessels so medial border of the triangle is by the you can see in the images also that this space is bounded medially by the vas deferens laterally by the gonadal vessels and the base will be formed by the peritoneum the apex will lie at the deep inguinal ring this is the triangle of doom now why it is doom because if you go here to apply a dagger to fix a mesh that will be disastrous that is a doomsday because underlying are the the vascular structures and what are the vessels they are external iliac artery and external iliac vein so you have to avoid tacking this now lateral to this is another structure called as the triangle of pain now lateral to this will be you know if you go the lateral space you have a medial space and the lateral space the laterally if you go you will have nerves and what are the nerves that are there these are lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh that will enter the thigh you have genito femoral branch of femoral nerve you have femoral nerve you have ilio hypogastric nerve you have ilio inguinal nerve you have sympathetic nerves but you understand that two nerves are very important to be safeguarded in laparoscopy that is genital branch of the genito femoral nerve the femoral branch the genital branch will not be seen that is the femoral branch of the genito femoral nerve and second is lateral cutaneous nerve of lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh this is the area where we should not tack where we should not fix any tacker because otherwise these nerves when they are injured you get uh, you know myralgia paresthetica that is you get numbness you get pain in this area that's a, uh, a wrong thing to be done so understand any tacks that you uh, fix the mesh should be above the iliopubic tract should avoid inguinal canal should avoid the triangle of doom the lateral space medial space because bladder is there and the operator no vessels are there corona mortis is basically what they say is this is uh, there is an uh, there is an abnormal uh, venous uh, you know not not abnormal you can say uh, uh, you know a, a bunch of veins thing were there which form the bendaved circulation and they will travel over the pubic arch pubic uh, superior pubic ramus and these veins uh, rickettsial veins you know these uh, veins pubic veins they form anastomotic you know circles over this one should not rub over the uh, cooper's ligament or over the pubic arch because these veins when they cause bleeding there is mess there is a lot of bleeding happens and the surgery becomes uh, you know difficult to continue with so that is what what is the bendaved circulation we call it uh, anastomo venous anastomosis or bendaved so this is another important thing that you need to know so if we see by now what we have talked about just a little bit of highlights we understand this area 
as an alien area because alien because we are not tuned we were not taught this anatomy in our medical school days laparoscopy was not then born but because of laparoscopy you need to revise this anatomy my submission to my postgraduates young recruits of laparoscopic surgery scholars is that you need to reread re reorient yourself many 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 times visit the videos check the anatomy get oriented into this area before you venture into a true journey and embark yourself for the laparoscopic repairs which we will be talking in the subsequent lectures the techniques of tap and tap kindly understand that anatomy is a must anatomy if you understand the surgery will become, become pleasurable and you will enjoy you will avoid most of the complications get oriented to this lecture time and again time and again and repeat it revise it i am sure the days are not far when you will be there doing laparoscopic transabdominal preperitoneal repair laparoscopic totally extra peritoneal repair till then i think i should wind up with that today's lecture please read about it get oriented and in my next lecture we talk about the techniques of repairs of the inguinal hernia thank you very much goodbye